Welcome to day three of the Future Security Forum for 2020. We're going to begin today uh, with some welcome remarks from Dr. Carol Evans, who's the Director of Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College, which is the premier institute uh, uh, within the Army of the Global Strategic and National Security Research and Analysis. She's got over three decades of experience in national security, including serving as the advisor to the Director of Central Intelligence, technical advisor to the National Ground Intelligence Center, and an advisor to the Defense Science Board. Uh, we extend a special thank you to Dr. Evans and the SSI for being co-sponsors of the Future Research Forum. Thank you, Dan, for that great uh, welcome and introduction. It is our great pleasure here at SSI to uh, co-host the Future Security Forum. Um, I'm going to keep my uh, remarks very, very brief because we want to get direct into uh, this afternoon's panel discussion. I want to provide just a very brief introduction to um, Sir Lawrence Freeman, who for many of you I know is a household name. Um, Sir Lawrence is the Emeritus Professor at King's College and he was Professor of War Studies from 1982 to 2014 and Vice Principal from 2003 to 2013. And before joining him, uh, Sir Lawrence has had uh, research positions both at Nuffield uh, College at Oxford University, um, the IISS, and at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Um, Sir Lawrence was educated at the universities of Manchester, which was my father's alma mater, uh, York, and Oxford. Um, Sir Lawrence, as we well know, is probably uh, the world's foremost authority on war, strategy, and international politics. Um, for most of you, um, important classics must be read. Uh, those include his uh, book on the future of war, and another one of his classics, Strategy, a History, was named uh, a best book in 2013 by the Financial Times and won the very prestigious W.J. Mackenzie Prize. Uh, Sir Lawrence is very well known in uh, the UK government circles. He is the official historian of the Falklands War, and he was appointed to serve on the Iraq War, also known as the Chilcot uh, Inquiry. And he's received many, many honours and hence was knighted uh, in 2003. So Sir Lawrence contributes or continues to contribute a lot to contemporary security issues, including uh, today's discussion, which focuses on um, strategy and the impacts of uh, global impacts of the COVID pandemic. So with that, please let me uh, turn it over to Sir Lawrence for remarks. A uh, quick foot footnote, if I may, for those participants that would like to offer some questions of Sir Lawrence, please submit them in the uh, Q&A box that you will find um, online. Thank you, Sir Lawrence. Carl, thank you very much indeed. And thanks uh, to the organizers for the opportunity. Um, let me just give some some headline points because we haven't got a lot of time. Um, the impact of COVID depends on uh, things that are very specific to the pandemic and and, and its uh, effect with developments that were in train anyway anyway. Uh, and these obviously include the question of who you elect as president in the United States, uh, which uh, probably is, is more important than almost anything else. Where going to talk about how it fits in with uh, whatever China is up to and, and the extent to which Xi uh, is asserting Chinese power, uh, as well as other questions like the development of the European project and a number of issues around the EU. Just a, a couple of points on, on things that, that were consequential on the pandemic. First, the most important is it's not over. Um, there was a sort of a sense uh, a couple of months ago, that somehow we uh, we might uh, uh, have suppressed it sufficiently uh, to uh, manage it by by very localized specific measures, um, but we're clearly now, at least in Europe and I think elsewhere, back in, in in a second wave. It may not be as bad as the first wave, but it's looking pretty demanding at the moment, and uh, and we have to assume that this is with us at least for another six months uh, and that obviously depends to a degree uh, on a, a vaccine. Now that's a statement that's made without thinking through the political implications of vaccination. Um, 
there's obviously a, a race on and with countries, pharma firms to develop a vaccine. A lot of these look quite promising, but you've got to get public acceptance for this. And as we know, there are many anti-vaxxer movements around uh, and how these interact um, will, will be important. And a lot then depends on how the vaccine is introduced, how good it looks, if, if there are side effects, uh, and, and if there are suddenly bad results, even with just one of these vaccines in one of these countries, uh, then that could have knock-on effect. Also, this is a major industrial undertaking to produce enough vaccines. So there's going to be lags, as there already are, in the impact of COVID on particular countries, particular regions, uh, so that India, for example, which came rather late in some ways to, to severe uh, infections, is going possibly to be later still uh, in being able to manage the whole thing be a, um, a vaccination program. Secondly, the economic consequences. Our government seems to have discovered debt um, in an embrace of modern monetary theory, uh, which means that as long as uh, people are prepared to hand over money at limited interest rates, you can go into as much debt as you like. How long this will last? I have no idea. One of the reasons for this is to try to uh, keep unemployment down. Uh, but unemployment is is going to go up, uh, and that is going to have start to have major political consequences. Uh, lots of people will be out of work. Some will be quite desperate. Uh, and again, if you look beyond the Atlantic area and go into um, a lot of th uh, third world countries or Middle East and so on, uh, we're going to see uh, some major uh, consequences uh, of that. And indeed, we we already. Are um, so desperation produces political instability. Uh, it's hard to say where that will come, what it will look like, which is just something to expect. Lastly, um, the, the, because I know this is something that people talk about a lot, is China. So China uh, looked like being this looked like being a Chinese crisis all by itself to start with. Then China, by methods that most of us couldn't emulate managed to uh, suppress it uh, and started to boast how well it had been it had done and started to move around um, helping others to show that, that having uh, succeeded in, in suppressing uh, uh, the virus it would now be in, in a position um, to lead the way out I don't think that worked as well as many people thought it might partly because some of the stuff they they sent around certainly to the UK, uh, turned out to be rather dodgy in terms of uh, of the tests, for example. Uh, and people didn't forget that, 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 that if they'd been a bit quicker uh, in acknowledging and dealing with this, then it might not have spread so disastrously and so quickly. Um, so, uh, but, but China doesn't seem to be suffering now as badly as others. So that raises uh, a question of whether this somehow shows that authoritarian systems, a Chinese model, is, is works better than others. I'd argue that if you look at South Korea and Taiwan, uh, you could argue more that there's a, an East Asian model, I think born of the SARS experience, um, that, that is actually more impressive. A lot of authoritarian states haven't done particularly well with this. Also, you can see uh, a determination not to be so dependent upon China in the future, for example, on supply chains. So I think that's an open question. But finally, and, and that hopefully we can, we can have a, a discussion, um, there's the interaction between um, uh, China's belief that I think somehow the, the Western world is distracted and the rest of the world is distracted by COVID and the belief maybe that this is a time to push on other issues. And I think there is a danger here, not particularly with the United States, maybe, or not directly with the United States, but certainly uh, we're seeing rumblings with India, with, with Taiwan. Um, and that's, again, something that to keep in mind. We're, we're, these have, this event is looking forward. Uh, none of us looking forward at, in, uh, in December last year imagined where we'd be uh, this time this year. Uh, events get you by surprise, and this has been a big one. There are events that are going to come up, whether it's a result of the assertiveness of China or political instability produced by COVID, that we can't 
anticipate. We don't know exactly where they'll be, uh, but that is going to be what will uh, mark the consequences of this as we move into the into the next year. I'll stop there, Carol, I think, and hopefully we've got a chance for some conversation. Great. Thank you. Um, I am waiting for some questions to come in, but I, while I have you, I thought um, if I may uh, use my role as facilitator and ask maybe the first question. Um, and that is, I'm very interested in your thoughts on the economic consequences. I mean, already, uh, I'm looking at our defense budgets in the US. I know we're pretty well secure for the next year, but we look into the 2022 timeframe and outwards, and we know for defense spending, that's absolutely coming down. Um, you know, there, there are mutterings from the Pentagon uh, that we're going to have a look at reduced budgets. I would imagine the same, of course, in the UK and, and elsewhere. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts there on the impact of those cuts. Um, and particularly when I look across potentially at the role of the Quad, um, where you know you mentioned India being a very important uh, partner, particularly for the US and UK as a counterbalance in the um, Indian Ocean region, that uh, she's been on a you know buying spree of uh, quite a few uh, major weapon systems, particularly from the United States. Um, but you know, are we going to be able to continue? to bolster those kinds of defense spending and acquisition purchases and what might be those impacts? Um, I think it will vary. I mean, oddly in the UK, uh, we're, we're just completing a major uh, review. Um, my expectation was that will be that defense spending will go up. Um, I think that's part because as a result of Brexit, the government wants to demonstrate uh, that it's, it hasn't just withdrawn into itself. So defence spending may go up. I think there's a, uh, but in other countries, uh, I would expect uh, in many others in Europe, probably not France, but I don't think we're going to see the, the, the rise in German expenditure that the Americans have been demanding. Um, uh, defence will continue to suffer. I think there's another slightly worrying question too, as to the readiness of uh, other European countries to assert themselves internationally. We've seen this in the Eastern Mediterranean at the moment, um, or with Belarus, where the EU own divisions may, may, has meant that it's been very hard to get it to sort of think of itself as an international actor. So um, I think that I think when when you look at the, the various problems around the periphery of the EU, um, whether it's in the former Soviet Union or or, or in the Middle East, North North Africa, um, there's an awful lot of, of difficult issues to come. Uh, and, and it's not quite clear how it deals with that. It's perhaps a final note. I think, um, although the UK is leaving the EU, I think what you, you will tend to see is Britain, France and Germany trying to work together precisely because of this limitation of the EU um, on issues like Iran uh, and so on. But, but uh, uh, by and large, COVID has been so absorbing, so demanding of the bandwidth of government, so they uh, have not been good at finding time for what's been going on in the rest of the world. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be very, very interesting. This is a very tough uh, arena right now. Um, I'm again looking at some of the questions coming in. Um, one of the uh, aspects that you also touched upon, obviously, is, is, is China, and there are many ways we can think about the pandemic. Um, and uh, from a strategic point of view, the role of China. I am a little bit, and it's sort of following on with economics perhaps, um, you mentioned the, the, the push on the part of the Chinese to use their response to COVID as a, a means of you know, public, di public diplomacy and, and raising their stature and image, which you know, as you pointed out has been somewhat problematic. Um, but I think the real point that I was taking away was the necessity for many uh, countries and companies specifically to disentangle their supply chains. And um, here in the States, we've seen that a lot, obviously, on the part of this administration, um, for example, Huawei, um, and, and trying to beef up our own uh, domestic 5G capability. Um, the other aspect would be from countries. And I'm curious what, you, what your feel perhaps is 
the impact of COVID with those countries as part of the Belt and Road Initiative? Are, are we likely to see countries be more circumspectual over their BR, BRI relationships, or are we going to see those perhaps continue? I think the interesting things about uh, Belt and Road for the Chinese uh, is they have inherited an awful lot of debt. Uh, I mean, a lot of the countries that have signed up essentially uh, did so on, uh, on, on debts from the China, that are owed to the Chinese, which they now will be unable to repay. And the Chinese have got some pretty interesting de decisions to make about whether they call in those debts, which would be pretty futile, whether they reschedule them, which creates its own precedence, or whether they start seizing assets, as, which is the sort of thing they've, they've done in the past. I think, uh, I think for those in Beijing who are wary about the liabilities being accepted under uh, Belt and Road, uh, this is a sort of vindication. Um, and I'm not convinced that, that, that it's going to have quite as much energy in the future uh, as it had pre-COVID. I think there's another issue that, that stems from the economics, which is that the, uh, there are others who know more about this than I do, but that the Chinese seem to have been getting everybody back to work, by many people as possible, by getting the factories going to produce goods that Chinese consumers won't consume. They're just, the market isn't big enough. And is that going to lead to dumping? Is, is that going to lead to other sorts of um, economic irritations? Uh, and lastly, you've mentioned the Huawei issue. I mean, it's quite striking, the change in mood with regard to China over the last couple of years in, in Europe. Uh, from seeing it largely in purely economic terms and in good economic terms, it's now seen as being much more threatening. And I think the Chinese have got themselves to blame a lot. This, this sort of wolf warrior diplomacy has, has, has rebounded. It, it doesn't go down very well. People don't like to be told they can't criticize China's human rights records lest they lose contracts and so on. So um, I, 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 I mean, whether or not this will lead to a rethinking in Beijing about where it's going and what it wants to do, I don't know, and I tend to doubt. But 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 I don't think you can argue that, that this has been a great couple of years for, for Chinese foreign policy. Lovely. We have um, a couple of uh, questions coming in uh, on the Google chat. Um, first one, if I may, your comments about the importance of the presidential election suggest you see the strategic consequences as more an outcome of personal leadership than structural factors. What changes to the security environment will endure regardless? Well, a lot endures. I mean, there's always much more continuity than, than, than commentators allow, and we always tend to um, see the long-term consequences from quite, quite short-term events. But I think this is different. I mean, again, from I'll speak from a European perspective. Um, I think there are real questions as to whether or not the alliance could survive a Trump second term. Um, it, it's be, it really is touch and go at the moment. And this is not just because the president doesn't like allies very much and because of the, the trade issues. There's a whole, uh, there's almost an ideological element to this now. Um, so whereas I don't, I mean, I think that the, a lot of the issues in terms of European contributions, are we doing enough, would remain even with the Biden administration. And the, the focus will be still be on China in different ways, but it'll still be on China. So I don't think there'd be massive changes in that direction. But it, it, I mean, if you look at the polling that's just come out, the, the, the view of the, of the Trump administration is very negative uh, in Europe. Uh, compared with the Obama administration, it's in completely other direction. So these things can change. But it would be wrong, I think, to underestimate uh, the difference of personalities in this sense too much. So it's, it's the flavour of a whole administration, not just uh, the president himself. The question is for you. Um, Sir Lawrence, do you feel that the recent rise in misinformation and disinformation operations represents a significant shift in the character of war moving forward? And if so, what can be done? Excellent question. Yes, and, and of course, you know, misinformation is, is not at all new. Um, deception operations are not at all new. Any historian of war can think of plenty in the past and propaganda uh, and, and so on. It just, it's just there are different ways of doing it and social media allows it to pass very quickly. 
And, and the answer is, um, I think we're much more savvy about this than we were. Uh, I think 2016 was a shock, not just to the UK and US, but in other countries as well, when it became apparent how much uh, of the stuff was being pushed around. Um, you can see it at work. I mean, anybody who's on social media can pick it out quite easily. Um, and I think going back to something I spoke about right at the start, the vaccination issue uh, is, is one where it wouldn't surprise me to start seeing lots of stuff going around, partly maybe just to discredit somebody else's vaccine in order to promote one's own. Uh, but you can, you can already see uh, quite a lot of that going on. I think if we can get through your election w w without um, too much mishap, uh, then that will give us a bit of a breathing space on, on these things. All one can say is it's ubiquitous, it, it's there all the time, it's routine, um, but we are much more sensitive to it than, than, than we were uh, a few years ago, and that maybe is a more hopeful sign. Great, great. I'm uh, waiting for other questions to come in, but. Uh... I want to go circle back to political instability. Um, you know, we, we already talked about the rise of economic nationalism within individual countries. Um, you know, whether parts of Europe, certainly here in the United States, elsewhere, um, and the division between the have and have nots. Um, and particularly when you think about how this vaccine, if and when, gets distributed, are we going to, you know, are those Fisher is going to be even stronger. And I'm, I'm curious where you see that instability perhaps being most grave from an international security perspective. Uh, I mean, the answer to some things I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, these things can come up in unexpected places. I mean, we know that there are some countries, say Pakistan, where attempts at vaccination have, have met um, violence in the past but from Islamist groups, and that could be a risk. Um, the, the, we, we know that the, there are strong anti-vaccination movements. And, you know, you need a certain level, even in Western Europe and the United States, you need a certain level of vaccination for, for it to work. It, uh, otherwise, you, people keep, will keep on coming back to hospital. So I think that's, um, that's one level of concern. But I think that much larger is, is, is just unemployment, indebtedness, uh, stress governments. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in some ways I'm surprised that there hasn't been more reaction in, in the sort of Iraq, Iran, Lebanon access, access to, to, to what has happened than there has been. I think you, you were predicting six months ago, you might have expected it to get much more difficult uh, there. I mean, especially given what Lebanon's been through. So um, you, you wonder whether that's just the dog that's, that's yet to bark, that, that, that at, some, at some point all the tensions, will, especially within Lebanon, will, will burst open. Uh, and when that happens, the knock-on effects in, in around the Middle East could be, could be substantial. So another question for you um, coming in. Uh, what is the single most difficult and dangerous strategic problem that our world faces today? <laughs> Um, well, you know, over the long term, I still I think climate change is 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 looming large. Uh, it's not a future problem; it's a current problem, um, and we've lost time in terms of international cooperation to deal with that. And, and it's uh, uh, I think the mischaracterization of the issue, uh, arguably by uh, both sides, in it, but, but I think particularly by those who who denied the human role, um, it, it, it has lost us a lot of time. Um, I think if you're in old-fashioned strategic terms, uh, how to accommodate uh, China, how to cope with China is, is, um, is as big as any. But the thing that, you know, that any student of strategy knows is it's not the big ones that, that, that catch you out. It's, it's the things that... Uh, uh, are below the radar that, that, that people sort of knew was a problem but weren't paying proper attention that, that, that have a horrible habit of catching you out. And I think just on, on the China question, I think there is a, an issue that this is often characterized as a US-Chinese strategic problem. You know, China has got arguments with lots of countries. Um, and 
I, I, you know, it's an issue that needs to be looked at in the round rather than just as a specific problem for the United States. Well, we have, we have four more minutes remaining, so I want to try and squeeze in a couple more questions for you that have come up. Um, this one, the world has avoided a nuclear conflict since 1945. What is the likelihood that this record holds up for the next 75 years? Um, it's, it's a great question because you know, it's, it's like an airline that's got a perfect safety record. Uh, you know, do, do you go on that one because of its perfect safety record or do you, do you reckon that we just can't last? I mean, it's too good to be true. Um, I, I, I think my, my view is that, is that we ought to be able to avoid a great power nuclear conflict. I can't think ahead 75 years, uh, but, but certainly in the coming years. But the risks of a smaller scale one, uh, so India, Pakistan being an obvious example, are very real, and and, and, and you know we've, you know the next administration, whoever is heading it, is still going to have the North Korean problem. So uh, I, I, you know, World War Three, hopefully we can still avoid, but but nuclear detonations, that's going to be harder. And I think we've got time for one more. Um, let's see. Uh, so Lawrence, does the West need a unifying grand strategy? Is this possible today in such a fractured, multipolar world? Uh, it's probably not possible. Uh, <laughs> it's, too, it's too complicated. Uh, I think there are certain themes that, that, that we, it'd be good if we could start to agree on, uh, even if it's in some sort of G7 communique. Uh, but strategy is an active thing. It's about interaction with others uh, who, who've got their own strategies. Um, and I think you know it comes back to, to the question of American leadership. I mean, if the United States is providing leadership up to you know recent times, uh, others would would be inclined to follow and, and try to fit in at least. You know, one of the striking things over the last few years, over the last year even, is the extent to which the in seat on Iran in the U.S. the U.S. takes a position nobody follows. Um, now, I mean, that, that, that is quite a change. So if we're going to get a grand strategy one way or the other, uh, the United States has got to find a way of re-engaging with its allies. Um, and then maybe we, we, we can recover some lost ground. I'll squeeze another one in then. And that is, uh, we have a question, what is the most effective means of preventing the rise of autocratic nationalist regimes within democracies? Are there any lessons for us today? I think that probably be our concluding question. Listen. Listen to what people are saying, pay attention, uh, don't dismiss concerns, don't patronize. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and if, but if we don't get our economics right, uh, even if you do all the right things, then there'll be a lot of angry people around. Very good. Uh, and I think, I don't know if we're on time, if we're segueing into the next session. Um, but I'll, if not, I will, if, if I'll continue then. Um, the one, another further question was, should we redefine our definition of national security when you have 200,000 dead in the US? Um, do we need to rethink what national security means? Ah, you think, are we losing? I think most countries, pandemics have been part of national security strategy, um, but I think they've been a bit marginal in national security. They haven't, we haven't prepared for them taken them seriously enough, but they've been there. If you look at the documents, you, you'll find pandemics mentioned. Uh, but, uh, you know, sadly, uh, in both our countries, uh, the capacity to deal with that has been run down. So it's been in, it's been in the documents, but not, uh, not, uh, not in the budget. And, okay. and we're suffering accordingly. Well, it's, it's the one o'clock hour, and I want to, again, thank you so much um, for presenting some important uh, and very thoughtful discussion for us to, to take away. Um, good afternoon to everyone and uh, thanks again. Thank you.